So uh, in the spirit of doing things a little differently, we're going to kick off with a speed round of questions because one thing that marketing people generally aren't known for is brevity. So everyone has a limit of two, maybe one word answers. Oh my. Yeah. That's well, okay. Yes, no, true, false. Okay. I'm going to start with a uh, yes or no. Will the title Chief Digital Officer be around in 10 years in an advertising agency? Angelo. I hope not. Oh, too many words. <laughs> no. I was born in Beaverdam, Wisconsin. <laughs> hey! <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, Mayo? <laughs> yes, Astrid. Ooh, that's two words. It's pretty good. Okay. They're connected. They're connected. Okay, Mayor, I'm going to start down with you this time. What is your single biggest challenge in your role as Chief Digital Officer? Single biggest challenge, uh, culture change, organizational change. Good. Constant education. Mm hmm Hmm. I think that... Oh, right, one more. <laughs> See? Mm -hmm. Synergy. <laughs> All right. Uh, hold on. Can I get a second? Can yes. I get a pass? Yes, oh, you wait, get a pass. On, number two. Get a do-over. Uh, <laughs> um... Um, I, it's, oh, oh, whistle. it's that's what the whistle's for <coughs> effectiveness effectiveness okay uh, change management mm -hmm. that's good so Smart sort of change. as a one, word answers, one I know right <laughs> hard um, so as a sort of parallel to that question what's the single most important skill that a successful chief digital officer should have diplomacy diplomacy mm-hmm Mayor? Uh, a good filter. <laughs> yeah, I, well, actually, I want to say a good BS filter. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Love of the business. Mm -hmm. uh, adaptability. Good. Who is the company that you admire most for their digital marketing? Not in the service provider side, but the actual a company that does great digital marketing. <laughs> I can start. Um, I'm a uh, one word. Yep. It in? It's hard, I know. Who? Red Bull. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Mars. Mars? Uh, that's, that was one of my clients. Candy. They were brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor? I think Josh took mine, so okay. I'll, I'll pick a, another one out. Coca Cola. Coke. Good job. They've always been good. IBM. IBM, also amazing. Okay, we're almost done with our speed round, then you can actually start to be verbose again. Um, <laughs> true or false, many of the mistakes that were made in the early days of display are being made all over again in mobile. True. <laughs> it's true. It's all your fault, you know, <laughs> clearly. Let's ask the chief digital officer about that. Um, yeah, true. True. Okay. Um, last of the speed round, and it's, uh, it's actually the theme of today. Isn't all marketing digital marketing now? I wish. <coughs> False. 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 Okay, good. All right. Okay, so you, these, now you can start to expand a little. But uh, why do you think? I think it was actually a surprise this morning when David was going through the stats to see that 40% of all the chief digital officers that he could find were coming from the advertising field. Why do you think that is? Say that again. <laughs> okay, don't. <laughs> why, why, why is advertising over-indexing with CDOs? Because advertising is so bad at digital, and advertising has has really had never really kind of um, uh, embraced the full. You know, they're always looking for traditional as the traditional answer, mm. and then doing some digital stuff is what's sort of yeah. Amazing. It's it, it become. I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in uh, where I'm asked, okay, well, how how would this live digitally, <laughs> versus well, okay, you know, how do you reverse engineer it? If you take you know, if, if you look at the past work that, that I was a part of with Geico, the commercials we wrote were written on search vernacular, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you guys remember the old guy in the bathroom with the gecko and the ringtones? And Cash with the googly eyes? That, that came from people searching uh, that gecko song. So we said, okay, let's give them ringtones and let's write a commercial around it. I think 
it's we're still in the dark ages. You know, you asked about about mobile. If mobile's in the dark ages with CDOs, we're replicating the same mistakes we made when we were building the first websites mm. because best practices didn't carry <laughs> on for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but if you don't, it, digital isn't a necessarily a destination. It can be an insight. And I think if you were using those insights to write copy for for uh, commercials or for video initiatives, that still makes it a component of the nucleus of the atom of your communications. And I don't think we're doing a good job at that mm. at all. I think from my perspective, um, it's, it's about the, the, the nature of the business, the consulting aspect of it. And I think there are other, other industries as well where you find this, where the, the companies that we all work with aren't, aren't ready to invest in it internally themselves. They don't know what it is, so they're looking outside. So they look to agencies and, and other service providers to come in with that expertise. So, you know, it's, it, the impetus is on us to understand it, be able to talk somewhat intelligently about it, to help guide them. And then, you know, I think it, as once they learn more, and, and, and I saw this a lot at Cantar Retail, then they start to invest in the resources internally. That's okay. great. Angela? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it, what you're hearing is that it's both internal and external forces, mm -hmm. right? Internally, I think, the sort of heritage and traditions of advertising, um, and there's a number of reasons why digital is is a difficult thing to embrace within those organizations. And I think we'll probably, mm. you know, talk about some of those in more detail. I think the other piece is literally, um, you know, what are our clients demanding of mm. us, right? If agencies are supposed to be leading their clients with thought leadership, and our clients are equally as confused in this space, then of course they are going to say, "You guys are the experts yeah. in this." help us mm -hmm. navigate the space. That's great. So some of the most effective digital marketing tools are also the least sexy, the data driven, the search. How do you guys attract the best talent to what is often the most important, but the least appealing parts of digital marketing? <coughs> Terrific clients. Um, having wonderful, inspiring clients that while you may only be doing, you know, a banner work or, social, or um, uh, you know, a, a potentially search uh, SEM, SEO work, it, it really does make a whole lot more, you know, some work we're doing right now for entertainment, it gets much more exciting when it's about something you can actually see and people are finding. Mm. Um, so while they may not love it for the first six months or of their, of their you know, their employment, they will dig it because it's a great client mm. opportunity. Yeah, I just, I'd add to that. I think um, when I was with the Martin Agency, we were winning new business all over the place, uh, and, and we got Agency of the Year that year, but the problem was it was banners and, and like you said, the down and dirty stuff. What we did was we started to go out, and this isn't popular with anybody, but we would give away the business for free to those things that we believed in. So uh, we did We Choose the Moon, if anybody saw that, for JFK, and, and that was... I went to Google and I went to our friends at AOL and asked them to give us $250,000 to do it. <laughs> so what you had was this camaraderie and people gathering around. It's, you're going to still be doing the banners. You're still going to be doing the necessary evils of the industry. But if we can throw a bone, get great work, get some great awards out of it, and get people to jump on a bandwagon, that works. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I think it is, it's about the output of the work, right? So you, a lot of people say, well, what kind of industry? What vertical? Oh, pharma. Mm. There are some tremendously mm. fascinating things happening in the pharmaceutical space yeah. that, you know, data, creative is all contributing mm. to. Um, so I, I kind of, for me, it ladders back to the work. Imagine what you could do for ED. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> So there's a, I mean, that's a good jumping off point um, <coughs> to talk a little bit about the role of data fluency. It's something that has come up, it, it come up in the last couple of years. And traditionally, chief digital officers will come from the publishing side or the technology side or the marketing side, but sort of very rarely sort of from a, a, a data centric perspective. Um, do you see the CDO in the short term future being significantly more data driven or will they just have like a chief data scientist sidekick? <laughs> I, I think 
I think that if, <laughs> if the role of the chief digital officer tends, in my mind, to be much more capacious than just a data-focused mm -hmm. role, um, you know, we always like to say there's tons of data, not enough insights, mm -hmm. right? So do you have sort of a chief insights officer? Mm -hmm. Does that live in a CIO, CTO function? I mean, those are all things that I'm not really sure we've all figured out yet. No. But I think the chief digital offers the role, yes, that might be part of its purview, but I think for that to be its sole focus may be mm. limiting. Or at least a qualifier. Right. I'd Mayor? love to. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mayor. I'd love go to have Mayor's I'd, I'd love to, in call it, no, give me two years, and I'd love to be able to parse the data, tabulate the data in a, as, a, optimally, as, as effective as a data analyst or a data mm. scientist could, because I think that. It's becoming, you know, yeah, how many times do I have to use the word big data in a, you know, in a, the client within a client meeting to feel like, Jesus, I really should know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> you know, I get uh, there's a 25 chapter book and I'm three chapters deep and I'm now going to chapter three and a half. I'm like, and now I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> so um, I'd love to be, uh, I'd love to add to that complexity to be really, really smart um, and and grow that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess uh, it's interesting. I was at a Harvard Business Review event, and someone asked the question in the context of big data: Should I start with the data, or should I start with the analytical tools? And the answer was neither. Start with the strategy. Start with the business question, and drive from there. You know, so to me, it's you know, I I, I think it's incumbent upon the chief digital officer and the organization, not necessarily to develop that specific skill set, but to be able to frame the right questions and then. Folk, you know, identify the expertise that can help answer that question. Yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, it's an old adage, but nothing kills, nothing kills a bad product like great advertising. <laughs> and I think, um, oh, thanks. Um, I think it's fun. But, but I think it's true. I think, I think what's missing is it, information is important, but, you know, it's amazing to me that we say, okay, track, trigger, and traject. What are you trying to do, right? Let's, let's, let's start with that. What I'm finding is when the data guys come into the meeting, they're not given the authority. So what happens is, in a creative brainstorm, look, here's the information, here's the insights based upon that information, here's what it's telling us, and then some individuals across the room will say, yeah, you know what we need is a pop-up store. That's got nothing to do with the information that we just discussed. <laughs> pop-up was your idea, wasn't it? I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry do I seem negative? Um, but, 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 you know, you, that, it, the information is golden track, trigger, traject, but what are you trying to accomplish, okay? And if your product sucks, then great advertising is only going to kill that product. And it's that simple. I just think unless you're taking that information and making sense of that information, one of the things that you should do is throw a spreadsheet down the center of the table and say, here's your data. That's data. That's information. But it doesn't tell you a damn thing because nobody at that table was going to read a packet that thick, right? So make sense of it first. What's the objective? Make sense of the information, then track, trigger, and traject. And I think that will also identify what data you want, right? The example, uh, back to the HBR thing, was if you look at two specific retailers, Walmart and Tesco, Walmart said it's about our supply chain and managing our suppliers in the supply chain. They focused on getting the data that they need to drive the cost out of that, and that's the core of their business. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got a company like a retailer like Tesco out of the UK that's focused on customer intimacy. Mm -hmm. and they you know, the pioneers of the loyalty cards, right? So they identify this is, this is the business strategy for us, this is the data that we need, these are the, an the analytics that we need, and that will feed back in and help us be more effective in our overall strategy. That's great. You can tell who the data guy yeah, is. Yeah, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> so can you guys share some examples of clients or other partners who've engaged sort of consistently at the forefront of digital innovation? And sort of a second part to that question, what has been your role as a chief digital officer to really push that forward? How do you sort of enable that engagement? I, um, I feel like I'm talking too much. No, you guys can just yell, shut up. <laughs> um, I, believe it or not, uh, I, think, uh, I think Walmart, uh, believe it or not, they, um, you know, we, we were agency of record when I was with the Martin Agency, and, and we did their in-store network and, and things like that. But... You know, when we were launching uh, some, some big movies for them, we turned the outside of Walmarts into a, a, an outdoor movie theater. I don't know if, if anybody read about that. But again, so now you've got to go into the store because you want to buy the movie. Uh, you've got to go into the store to get popcorn. And now you're at a drive-in theater. But it's, it's using the store as experiential. We also, with the in-store network, when we first started working with them, you guys, you guys all know the in-store network, right? Smart network, it's called. Nobody wants to admit they go to Walmart. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah, I heard it. I read some about it. Um, but, but what we did with that was when we started working with them, we saw that they, they could close the sales loop by the end of the day, okay? The end of the, the day that something ran on the screens. They were just using those screens as entertainment. The, the statistic that nobody wants to talk about with Walmart is the average customer spends 20 minutes inside of a Walmart. They spend 12 of those 20 minutes lost. <laughs> It's a fact. So, 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 so what we, so what we did was we said, okay, you know, you, you can't sell, don't sell bathing suits on a screen in the bathing suit aisle, right? Sell suntan lotion. And what we were able to do is to serve up a better algorithm that said, okay, here, here's how we're, bless you, here's how we're going to, um, here's how we're going to sell products. So what we could tell by an algorithm based upon weather, based upon traffic patterns, and based upon purchase and the number of times something showed up on a screen, we could tell you a better practice to sell your product within the Walmart store because we know people are lost, we know what the weather is, we know, we've got the algorithm down. So to me, that was pretty, pretty damn cutting edge. Mm, that's great. Mm, that's good stuff. Um, the uh, work, uh, I guess I think that a lot of the work that I've, we've been doing with Google with that uh, story uh, uh, is really allowing, uh, believe it or not, allowing us to more effectively sell their products to a small group of publishers, 2,000 or so. But more interestingly, it was creating the content, both you know, uh, infographics and you know, uh, social media solutions and, and actual you know, decks that were actually educating the Googlers who didn't know exactly how the product worked, which I thought was really interesting that in fact, even though the, the brilliance of Google, so smart, such a great company, is that you have this en enormity of a sales organization that is just a, needs, needs to be educated on the actual way the product works insofar as they need to be able to explain it to, just so you know, here's how it works and here's why it's awesome, you know, publisher. It allowed it, us creating this content, uh, created this you know um, window, so that the, all the salespeople had the ability to really uh, to to capture. I, I get I grok what this product does and how awesome it is. Like real time bidding, boom! Now I get it. I understand why it's so awesome and why it's terrific and how I, how I can sell it more effectively. And uh, interestingly enough, the product itself, the content, is becoming the brand, and the brand itself. And I think this is more general. Brands themselves are, are less important, but the content that surrounds the brand is actually the thing that's really the brand. And the content is like, oh yeah, of course it's stuff soap, but it's it's the you know it's the it's the you know it's the campaign that surrounded it and the and the content that was created around it that really makes it brilliant. Which is I I think uh, something that that uh, that I I'm inspired to continue that progression of what's what's going on in the industry. It's really the content is what's going to matter most, and brands are going to be important yet not critical. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to touch a little bit upon the role of the chief digital officer in a lot of this, and I'm sure it's very different across the board. Um, from my perspective, what I think is incredibly interesting is that you know, the brand sort of sits at the center of all of this, right? So these content marketing activities, these app developments, these product extensions, um, the ability uh, for advertising agencies, and I purposefully am using the word advertising because I think there's a lot of equity in mm -hmm. that even though really we're talking about a marketing yep. landscape. Um, to sort of sit at the center of the brand, have those high level CMO relationships and driven primarily out of client trust, you're then able to evolve that conversation beyond banner ads. You know, in the case of some of the work that we did for Jack Daniels, we took a look at some of the data and we said, hey, wow, a bunch of people are going to your site. Oh, and by the way, it's because they're searching for recipes and they're trying to do a distillery tour. Maybe we should create, you know, a responsive website. I mean, that's just a simple example, but I do think it's these kinds of um, evolutionary steps that we take that help our clients think about advertising and marketing solutions in a very different way. So do you have a, a company that you think is doing, digital, Angela, digital marketing consistently well at the forefront? Oh, Who do you think? right. Second, the first part of the question. Yeah. Did I not say IBM? Oh yeah, you did say, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Mayor? Um, yeah, I think the, the, the question we were talking about is sort of examples mm. of uh, projects. And it's actually it's a tough question for me to answer. It's sort of again, my, the nature of what I do is a little mm. different. Um, in that, what what Kantar Retail does is we're a data and insights provider uh, to predominantly consumer goods and retailers. Um, so there's a little bit of sort of a step. You know, we're, I guess the challenge and and where I've seen success and actually 
going back to some of the earlier panels around publishing, is about how do you package up some of that content, package up those insights so that they're, they're consumable um, in whatever form that an end user, an individual, wants to, to achieve that. Um, so, you know, I think examples where you can take that one insight and deliver it via, you know, a white paper, a, a data report, a video, a podcast, et cetera, um, are, you know, the things that I gravitate mm. to. So, I mean, a topic that's close to many people's heart in this room is like everyone's trying to solve similar, similar issues, but from different lenses. So, you know, the publishing industry, the broadcast industry, the advertising industry, we're all desperately dependent on each other, but there seems to have been like a, a real lack of collaboration in terms of finding common solutions. Like solutions tend to come from within your industry and then try and push it, and then you've got sort of ad tech in the middle. Um, why do you think there hasn't been as much collaboration between the media owners and the advertising industry on just what's next in digital? Well, I mean, it's, it's politics more than anything. I mean, I think, you guys, you know, when we worked with Geico, do you guys know what the media budget was for Geico? I'm going to get fired after yeah. all this. Yeah, it's got lots of zeros. Bajillion. Lots of zeros. It's, it's, a, it's a billion dollars, <laughs> no. okay? They're spending a billion dollars a year. Now, we used to get crucified because people would say, I don't get it. What's with the, gut, the gecko and the cash and the caveman? And the, because, the, the, okay, we set it up and we said, look, this is a multi-storytelling tiered way of communicating. But the fact is, if I put the gecko on your TV screen, every one of you would kill me with a billion dollars worth of media. You can't do it that way. You've got to find these different attributes. So we can back reverse engineer any way we want to. But I think what happens is, just because of the politics of that, Horizon did the, the media buy. And I got to tell you, it, we asked openly, I said, can, can we get them to have office space? Give them office space with us so that we're working hand in hand with the media buy. And it never happened. So we were in a constant state of re-engineering ourselves to communicate, OK, now we need a caveman. Now we need a gecko. Now we need cash. Now we need a sponsor. Because that, that synergy isn't working. They're, they're trying to protect their territory because guess what? The Martin Agency does media too. Okay? If, if we can just break down those walls a little bit, we're all going to stay gainfully employed. Advertising communications are not going to go away. But you can have a better triggered communication stream by working hand in hand, if you look back at the stuff with Andy Azula, the whiteboard guy, you guys remember the UPS stuff? That's where we did it best because we worked hand in hand with the media and we got free stuff out of it. So the Final Four and the, and the March Madness, we said, hey, can we give you guys a whiteboard, a UPS sponsored whiteboard to, to draw your plays on? And they did. So we got free media out of that just because we worked with them hand in hand. It always works better. But again, if, if, you're, if you're marking your pissing territory and don't let other people in, you just shot yourself in the foot, and you shot yourself in the foot on behalf of that client that's paying you. It's a lot of analogies in one sentence. Thank you. <laughs> I, I was born in... <laughs> yeah, I, I guess for, as I look at it at a macro level, fundamentally it's a communication question. It's are we speaking the same language in the same way that we started today saying everybody in the room, you know, whether you have the title of Chief Digital Officer or not, has a different definition of what it is. I think that's part of the challenge that we face today around collaboration is we come, we sit across from tables from one another, and we're not necessarily talking at the same level mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason. Not, sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's not. But I think that's the bridge we have to cross to be able to facilitate more broad uh, communication and collaboration. But isn't it right, I mean, isn't it that you know, we're, all, we're all doing the same job, similar, I mean, we're similar jobs at least. And I think that there is that, I think you kind of hit on it, that it's, it's politics, but it's kind of revenue, actually, is what it really is. Um, it's kind of revenue. You know, I'm not going to share my kind of the inner core secrets that I believe might, in fact, be uh, ownable or potentially usable by another p publisher or whatever it happens to be because I'm, I'm afraid uh, that by sharing that, in fact, it, it, it ends up giving you the, the, the leg up in the negotiation or in something. So I think we all have to uh, agree to some sort of utopian future that in fact it won't matter and we'll all be in Star Trek and wearing outfits and it'll be great. Um, uh, but I think that's the challenge that we have to be willing, I think it, it's almost, the, if this were the room, this is the room to kind of figure out, we need to, how can we work together in, that, in, that, in a balanced way that, isn't, that we're gonna sort of shake hands and be like, listen, I'm not gonna see your stuff, you're not gonna steal mine but we're gonna work on this together and figure out how we can, because it's all about change management, how do we evolve these organizations which are desperate to evolve and, and do it together, sort of unified. I, I think it's symptomatic of what's happening around sort of technology being a disruptor, right? So 
consumer is no longer experiencing things in a linear way, the world is more complex, we're looking at you know, a systems w- approach of how we do things. And in the meantime, it's frankly a land grab, right, for mm-hmm. agencies. Every agency suddenly builds a social practice, has a digital practice, has a content marketing practice. And I think at some point in time, you need to think about you know, the, the value of integration mm-hmm. at versus something like an orchestration or collaboration mm-hmm. model. And then in order for that to truly work, I mean, at the end of the day, it comes down to the money, right? Mm-hmm. So how do you incentivize people through money to collaborate? Mm-hmm. I mean, if they're not incentivized to do that, then it's going to continue to be this historic separation between creative and mm-hmm. media and everyone and else wanting their piece of the pie. Mm-hmm. So speaking of money, um, uh, I'd like to talk a little. Paying us now, I'm paying everybody. <laughs> um, I'd like to talk a little bit about ad tech, the category b- group of companies, not the conference. Um, so a l- ton of investment dollars have gone towards ad tech, and if you think about their role, it's generally to optimize, deliver, measure. But it's it's middleware, right? You know, the two highest value um, elements are what is being created and where is it going? So, you know, the media side of the business, the creative side of the business, they're also enormously complex and very much people-based. But um, again, has ad tech significantly helped in terms of raising the level of the entire industry? Or is it actually hurt in terms of diverting funds, diverting attention, and actually making the landscape so complicated um, that it is very difficult to actually get things done? Uh, Leading I, question. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll kick this one off only because I, I get my, my role recently changed about three months ago, and I, I changed my number to be, um, you know, the, the number for InfraStory was my phone number. Uh, so I get a lot of calls. And there's, of course, a, a gatekeeper who answers them, but she you know, passes nice enough, nice enough to pass most of them on to me. And the quantity of calls from mobile ad serving, you know, vendor number 17 is quite a lot. Mm-hmm. And I'm just curious if there were a way to sort of lessen the complexity of the quantity and maybe make them, mm-hmm. you know, more robust. It would probably be smarter. <laughs> Gold rush. Yeah. I think if you look just to be sort of reductive about it at the Terrence Kawaja chart, there are advertisers on one side and publishers on the other. And everything in the middle is taking from either the advertiser's margin or the publisher's margin. So I think if you were to reframe that question, does inserting all of these companies in the middle actually benefit by separating advertisers and publishers from having a direct relationship? So, I don't, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, what's, that? what's the, the answer, answer to your is. own question? I mean, I, I don't think it's obviously benefiting. Um, but I do think, you know, people go where the money is mm-hmm. and there's just a ton of money on the buying and planning side. And I think you also need to think about technology systems and automation. You know, how long does a media agency have a ton of media planners? Mm. How long is an ad operations team 50 people? Mm. Um, so, I mean, that's a, that's a different issue, right? The, the, the speed at which technology is destroying jobs versus creating mm. them, too. Uh, I, uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> no, I would just add that I think, you know, I think we need, it's, it's, I, I'm torn on that question just because I think, I think we need both. I think sometimes cutting edge makes you bleed. Mm. Um, but on the other hand, on the other hand, if, if we're not if we're not pointing at a star, you can't hit the moon. I think I think with some of these technologies, even though there's too much of it, I, I'm full of these. Dude, I'm, 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 I'm going to tweet all of them later. I'm think, <laughs> <laughs> there, wait, why does it say Sackett's an we asshole? <laughs> Guy with the plague, the steel scrub. The plague and the whistle. Um, but <laughs> plague and whistle. Um, but but no. But I do think that I, I do. Th- that I don't get out much, so this is really. Fun. I think part of it. You, you, if you don't, if you don't do those those cutting edge things, if somebody out there, unfortunately, to your point, there's too many people, right? right? And they're stealing fifty million dollars when all we're asking for is five. But I think what happens is if, if somebody isn't coming up with those things, we can't apply it to our daily mm. career, our daily jobs. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful and hurtful all in, all in one big mess up here. So. Yeah, that innovation never came from the advertisers. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So it's, I'll call it a one in 40 shot that you're going to pick up the phone and have it be the right, like, oh, I'll take that meeting. Oh, that's interesting. And then actually ends up being executed. No. So it's, but so is it, is it worth the time? Maybe not. That's right. <laughs> 
So back to the, the creative side, um, think of back to the past year, what was your just your personal favorite um, digital initiative that you saw? Mine was the Oreo tweet during the Super Bowl uh, that, that crushed tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars worth of TV investment. Um, Angela? Um, I actually love what Sour Patch Kids did. Uh, it came out of Mother. I, I mentioned I'm biased. My husband used to work there. Mm. Um, and I, a lot of clients do this. They hold an innovation fund idea. And it's like, submit an idea. It might get funded. And at the time, Xbox Connect was launching. So uh, they actually created a proposal to launch a Sour Patch Kids video game. And actually, um, it launched, it went to market. It's actually an additional revenue stream for a candy brand. You could buy the game for $5, and it's actually a fairly well-reviewed game. Um, and I just thought it was really interesting and sort of bold mm. for a candy brand to mm. do something like that. That's cool. I think overall the um, best advertising ideas, and uh, interestingly enough, ended up not being advertising at all. The, that the reason why I suggested Red Bull earlier is because I felt like that was the most genius advertising stunt ever, uh, or to date, that I've seen, at least the most uh, extended into space. Um, and it was the best solution to sort of make people aware of the brand and the connection between the brand and what the brand's lifestyle stands for. I thought I loved that. Yeah, I like the the natural light in space. Did you guys see that one where the, those, those guys just put the can of beer and uh, on a balloon it went up into space, popped and came back down? Nobody saw, saw that. that. I did not see that. Okay, natural space light theme. in space. Okay. First, first can of beer in space. I thought that was, I thought that was genius. But I also think uh, one of the technologies that I really like that hasn't been fully utilized. If you guys are familiar with leap motion, if you guys get a chance, take a look at that. It's basically, you know, just like you can do on your iPhone, pinch just and expand everything. Yesterday, right? But you, you, you can do it in air. And I think somebody's going to find a really good use for experiential initiatives for that one. So leap That's motion, I think, is cool. Cool, Mayor. Yeah, for me, it's the, 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 the Red Bull. I mean, anytime you push someone out of a plane or <laughs> space capsule. Um, you know, but it was as much the, you know, just the, the, the YouTube aspect of it I thought was, was great. Um, and, you know, because I, honestly, I had my head somewhere else. Missed it the first time around, and all of a sudden, I just started seeing this stuff popping up on Facebook and Twitter, and you know, directing me straight to YouTube. And uh, there I was, sitting there, just captivated by it, and watching it over and over again. So to me, that was phenomenal. Okay, so last question before we open it up to the audience: How does your mother or father or f your favorite boomer in your life describe what you do? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, <laughs> I'll start that one. They don't. They still ask me, "What, what, what is, is it that you, you do?" do? <laughs> Jonathan. I, well, my, my parents are still in Wisconsin. Um, so, so, they have the internet there, I believe. So, yeah, so what they, I mean, like my, I just went out to visit my mom and she said, uh, so, so what do you do? And then I said, well, here's what, and she goes, okay, but like, what did you do today? Like, tell me what you did today. So she can put it into her lens and, and I could, it still escapes her. Oh, yeah. Sometimes it escapes me, I guess. <laughs> my, my parents are from uh, Pennsylvania, so it's just a hair, it's, it's, it's a scintilla better. Um, uh, from a geographic uh, perspective or distance to New York, um, and my mom uh, asks me. It, it's a, it's a, my mom asks me a lot about the. Uh, so how was your how was your day today? And then kind of goes into the detail of how her day was, which is great, which I always appreciate. But I always find that the quantity that she actually understands the depth. I think she's actually she's a PhD in math, so I have to give her that. So she kind of gets digital. But I think the look <laughs> 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 her up, right? Uh, I think that. Uh, um, they, they, I describe it as, I describe it as, uh, you know, I do digital advertising and she grasps it as you make the television commercials. And I'm yeah. like, oh, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just say, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, my mom just thinks I work with computers. Work with yeah. computers. <laughs> nice. It'd be a great, great question for over drinks for everybody as well. So I'd like to open it up to the audience. We're ready for anything, Jesse. Ready. Okay, question right in the middle. Hi, uh, so great panel, by the way, thank you. I'm always curious, I always ask agencies this when they come pitch me, what are the projects you wish somebody would send you an RFP for? Oh, yeah. <laughs> like when you think of the digital space, what is the dream RFP you mm. wish would come over the wall at you to go, mm. to go see if you could win? 
So I had it. And don't okay. say it's like a gazillion dollars because no, none of us have no, it. No, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's always a great mix of, you know, sort of the creativity, the technical challenge, and something yeah. with great cultural resonance and like resonance. And I had a great one from Linda Perilou many years ago when she first joined American History of yeah. American Natural History Museum. I always get that wrong. Sorry. You know, pick your favorite but it's brand, like, like taking all that amazing stuff. It's great. Sorry, yeah. you keep going. <laughs> but, you know, pick, pick any brand that you've loved working with. What's the project you really wish you, you could have done with them? Mm. Oh, I don't, I, uh, I'll go first. Yeah, hit it. I think um, for me it's, uh, I, and again, I feel like I'm being negative. I, I think the RFPs are wrong. Uh, nine <laughs> times out of ten, everybody, er, er, what I find is this. When we did the We Choose the Moon thing for Kennedy Library, if I say JFK, the first thing that comes to your head is Lee Harvey Oswald, conspiracy, all these uh, uh, philandering. Um, and when you and say JFK to me, I think airport. But that's What's that? <laughs> yeah, I think airport, airport too. Yeah. Oh, from okay. I'm, from, yeah, we're, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not from around here. Um, but I think, I think what, what happens is, is that the, what they gave us was they said, how would you create a poster to commemorate uh, the 40th anniversary of landing on the moon? If I was to commemorate landing on the moon, I don't think I'd make a poster. It's <laughs> <coughs> so... That's exactly, so I, I, you know, to your point, I, I, I like a challenge that involves creativity with accountability, okay, so that we can say, look, here's, here's what we did, here's why we did it, here's why it had talk value or whatever, but for me, it's, it's that I, I like to take a look at an RFP and say, okay, but what are they trying to do? If you want to commemorate and make JFK look a little bit better about pioneering uh, this trajectory, then you reevaluate the RFPs. I just I want I, I like it when I don't agree with the RFPs. I don't think the clients always like it, but usually a better product comes out of that tension. Uh, maybe that doesn't exactly answer your question, but I, I like it when they tell me, here's what we think we need, and I go, but what are you trying to do? Let's start over because a poster ain't gonna do it. Yeah. <clears throat> I think a lot of the work that story does, we have a great <clears throat> we have a, you know obviously a, the execution piece of it, but the, one of the best pieces that we do is we have a digital process, or sorry, a, a strategic process that allows us to sort of uh, my CEO is famous for saying, uh, uh, begin at the beginning, and I really, uh, like Jonathan, I like to have that opportunity to take that RFP and be like, this is interesting, yet why don't we start back at A, because you're at R, and I'm confused about R, uh, but if we had A, we could sort of go through all the letters and actually get R, and we might be in a completely different place, but it will allow us to do that. But I think, to, to answer your speci uh, question specifically, I think um, I, I just have loved all the Nike Fuel work. Um, I'm just so, I love the idea of connecting humans and technology, maybe just because I'm like a total techie geek, yeah. that I, I would have loved to have done that. <laughs> I would have loved that. Do you have anything? Well, I was just, uh, you know, echoing what you guys are saying about being prescriptive. I mean, I do think our industry struggles a lot with sort of check the box. Is it integrated? Does it have an mm -hmm. online banner and an app and a microsite? And, and I, I like to, I think, have conversations that really are driven out of how am I held accountable? What does success look like? What are you ultimately trying to achieve? And then not necessarily, oh, and by the way, we've bought the media, so don't forget to you know, fill yeah. in Sounds these other funny. deliverables yeah. that we need done. So I, and for us, I think it tends to be more about the ability to feel comfortable playing a consultative role, like asking the questions that uh, maybe uh, aren't very easy to answer or have already been answered under a different context and sort of reopening that conversation up and looking at it from a new perspective. <laughs> Uh, because I think oftentimes people hire advertising agencies to make 15 second spots. And I think that's what we are all, at least all of us on this panel, are trying to sort of um, not turn the lens away, but to sort of zoom out and say that the universe of those types <coughs> of solutions is much broader than that. So I think just even the ability to sort of look at an RFP that doesn't say make these three things, I think would be um, a tremendous improvement against some of what we've already seen today. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with the Nike idea. The only thing I'd, I'd add to that is that Morton Salt was a client of ours. And you can't get more basic than table salt, you know? So that, that RFP I, I, I quite enjoyed because that, you know, Nike ID is cool, huge, and big. Really try to sell salt. <laughs> you know, so there's there's something there's something about that minimalistic approach to find to find that challenge. If you can do that, you can do anything. It's true. Do we have time for one more question? No. Oh, nope. there's many. Okay, speed answers this time. Okay. There's one here, one here, one here, one here. Before. <laughs> yeah. Let's go over here. <laughs> 
So just a quick question on technology. Um, I spent six years running an ad tech company, so hopefully I wasn't Sorry. wasting all that time. <laughs> but uh, now I understand why Josh didn't return my call. Oh, come on. I call everyone back. But I guess, qu quick question. I think they, they exist for a certain reason. There's a real void there. They're solving problems. They're innovating. I guess the question is, where do you see technology fitting into uh, the agency world and strategy going forward? Because um, a lot of these companies are there uh, and clients trust them because maybe they don't trust that the agencies can build or, or operate or innovate on technology. So how important is that when the world's going to data, programmatic, and uh, a lot of technology-based businesses? Yeah. Speaking from a creative perspective, and I sit on the 4 A's Creative Technology Committee, and we talk about this a lot, the creative technology term, what does that mean? I'm actually married to one. Um, so, you know, what I, think is, <laughs> what I think is interesting about that is you've seen a lot of agencies take the sort of three-legged approach. So the idea that creativity with a capital C has always lived in an advertising copywriter relationship, I think you're starting to see that evolve a lot. And I also think it's really interesting when you just think about culturally, what are the sort of icons that we hold up against innovation and creativity? It's not a creative director somewhere. It's a 22-year-old that started Snapchat. You know, mm -hmm. So really the importance of technology being able to make something real as opposed to just conceptualize something and take an idea, even a great idea, to one that's executable, um, I think is integral to making digital products. I just add my, uh, my comment to that. You know, I think what I see a lot of them uh, is technology around data. And so there's the big push that, you know, within Kantar and others that we've got all these data sets, how do we bring them together? We need technology to do that. And again, it goes back to my earlier comment, it's like, what's the problem we're trying to solve? There are lots of ways that we can tackle that before we start investing, whether it's in data or in technology, let's step back and frame the problem so that we can be more efficient in terms of how we get there. It's great. I think we're officially out of time, are we? Oh no, we're gonna keep going, aren't oh, we? We're standing between you and snacks. Oh, There's that, nice. all right, let's go. Okay. Um, <laughs> George Cobb from Metrotech. If there was uh, one or two things that you could hone in on that would improve your relationships with like uh, broadcast companies, mm -hmm. what would that be? Broadcast companies, uh, so are we talking uh, cable Sales? slash? Uh, All of them. All of them. Any of them. For, for, for revenue, from a revenue perspective for the agency or is it, or is it for the? Any uh, perspective I you think want it, to it's been on. disassociated. Like the wrong people are talking to the wrong people. Yes. Like you don't, you, you have 20, the mythical 28 year old media planner talking to a salesperson from a broadcast company. And the impact of those conversations is just not broad enough. So that's one thing I'd change, just get mm -hmm. the right people to the table, the right people having relationships. I agree with that. If the showrunner could sit with the creative director yeah. and actually really <laughs> Huge. have Huge. You know, well, what do you, what's the show about? That's kind of cool. Let's watch it. Yeah. Let me talk to what I'm interested in. And then have, uh, I'm sorry. Let's not watch it. Let's talk about the the treatment of the script uh, before anything's even put to in the anything shot at all, mm. because um, many of the challenges that we frankly probably have all faced is in fact <coughs> we get the hey here's the oh god we're launching on Tuesday can you make a site for Tuesday is that cool and can we put some product in there right, somehow okay. can we, we do that up, we'll it. Um, so the the <laughs> bolting on uh, within broadcast is can be bad because. Uh, you end up having a product that you don't have the whole lot of influence over that you have to bolt on a brilliant digital solution that should feel like it was inextricably linked all the way through. It's yeah. actually hard to do. So the earlier you can do it, um, uh, the better it is. So I think that's a, a great, that's a, to, uh, to pile on to Jane's answer, it's really what the way that we got, should be going. Question for all of you. Um, how many of your clients do what they would do if they weren't afraid, and how many of your agencies do what you would do if they weren't afraid. Do they take those risks? I'll start again. Um, uh, as an agency, story is really ballsy. Um, we go in with what the answer should be. And sometimes we don't get it. But I like that we go in with the right answer. It's tough and to tell someone their baby's ugly. You, well, you know, you don't tell them they're ugly. You'd say, like, listen, if you put the blanket up a little higher, <laughs> uh, you, you can sort of augment certain areas. I, I, don't, I don't think there's, there's always, I think, like salt. Uh, you can always find something brilliant about salt. Salt is hard, man. Everyone uses salt every day. They touch it all the time. How can we make salt exciting? So I think that the, the hard question for an agency executive is, Am I willing to risk the potential loss of this, call it at least $100,000 of effort of free, 
um, uh, on a, you know, like, hey, we're not answering the question you want from an RFP perspective, but we're answering the right, we're answering what we believe is the right answer for what you feel we need from a business perspective. Yeah, there's also a, there's a, you don't know what you don't know, you know, and, and I think in, in working with McDonald's for years, you know, the, the, there, there's challenges that I didn't know about, right? So do you guys know why the McRib isn't on the menu? Because it was McDisgusting? <laughs> no, no, no. no, no, but that's, it's, it's because, so, you know, it's the most popular burger, seasonal burger that they have. But what happened was it, it single-handedly depleted the world's pork supply. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, again, in... in yeah. <laughs> Is anyone from McDonald's in the audience today? <laughs> you are correct, sir. Um, no, but, but again, it, it, if, if we check egos... Uh, I think it's a combination of fear and ego. You know, I, you don't know what you don't know, so you're afraid to ask. Yeah. Not, not you, but I mean, one. One is afraid. So I think if we, if we check those egos and check the fear, everybody doesn't want to talk about this pen. This pen doesn't necessarily need a social component to everything you do, but there's a bigger way to think about it, okay? That it's about writing, it's about creativity, it's about partnering it with a paper company. I think that's, that's how these companies have to think, not innovation in isolation doesn't work. Can it work inside an organization, or does it have to come from outside? I, I think, think, totally works I think inside. it can yeah. work inside. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think it can work inside an organization, but I always get back to how do you incentivizing people to experiment and innovate, right? Because that's late, the, the risk of failure is, is what holds people back. But if there's failure metrics, if there's a reason, if it maps back to how many things did you try to do that were different that you failed at, oh, by the way, good job, you get more money. Mm. I mean, that changes the culture drastically. You can walk into an organization, be sitting across the table from a chief marketing officer who says, you know, I understand what you can offer and I, you know, let's talk, start at the beginning and work forward. Then they try and sell it back into their organization and their organization isn't a board, doesn't understand it. I think, yeah, you, have, you, you run into a lot of challenges that way as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, panelists. Thank you very much, audience. <laughs> <laughs>